I found out monsters are real after going to a party with my best friend. Come on, he'll never find out. I pestered my best friend for the millionth time. Looking back, I regret pressuring her the way I did. Maggie hugged one of her many large plush sheep closer to her chest, hinting she was about to give in to my suggestion. He always finds out. I swear he knows everything. She reminded me. We've only known each other for five years, and yet it felt like we had been friends for our entire lives. Maggie was raised by her single father. From what I've seen, he wasn't interested in dating and did everything in his power to take care of his daughter. But to be honest, he creeped me out. He was the very silent type, only speaking when it was important. I couldn't put it in words, but the vibe I got from him whenever we were alone was just off. I didn't suspect he would ever hurt me or Maggie. At times it felt like his eyes saw things normal people shouldn't. Okay, so even if he does find out, what is he going to do? Take away your phone, ground you. I think that's worth it. I shrugged. Maggie looked younger than she was. Most people thought she was just starting high school and not about to graduate. She was book smart but a bit childish with other things. She was never interested in going to parties, dating, or doing the normal high school events. Now she found herself in the final days of school, not experiencing any of it, regretting her choices. She wanted to go to a big year-end party before prom. The students held every year on an abandoned farm nearby. The local police turned a blind eye to the party, as long as no one got hurt and the bonfire stayed under control. I suppose, let me think about it for one more day, she said but I was done listening to excuses. I'll pick you up at eight. We'll tell your dad you're staying at my place and my parents work nights so they won't notice I'm missing. Finally, she relented. To celebrate, I asked for the last can of cream soda in the fridge. I would need to go down the stairs to get it. Sounds of a table saw came faintly from the garage so I knew I would be in the clear. I was halfway back up the stairs with the cold can in my hand when the sounds stopped. Maggie's father appeared behind to be at the foot of the steps covered in sawdust from working. I froze in my tracks wondering how he moved so fast. He builds custom furniture that I heard sell pretty well within a certain circle of people. The pieces all looked pretty basic to me, so I didn't understand it myself. And what were you two discussing? He asked in an even monotone voice. He was tall, stern with thick black hair that matched Maggie's. His eyes were cold as ice and I still wasn't used to him staring in my direction. I also didn't like how he used my full name instead of the same nickname everyone else said. It was always Anne, not Annie. Oh, you know, girl stuff. I am feeling stressed. There was no way he knew of our plans to sneak out to the party that weekend. I do know, he said, and I felt my heart stop. Prom is coming up. Tell me your plans when you finalize the arrangements. I breathed a sigh of relief. He turned to leave, but then added one more thing to the conversation. Please ask for my help if you are ever in trouble. Okay. I nodded slowly, unsure of what that was all about. I watched him leave a bit confused over the interaction. The rest of the night was fairly normal. We talked about how the party might go, then the last few assignments of the year, and finally a small mention of prom. I've had a few people ask me out, but I refused them. A few guys in the small anime club asked Maggie, but she saw them all as friends. After rejecting half the members, the club had slowly been pressuring her to leave the group. I could tell it bothered her. I told her to hell with prom and that we could just hang out together that night. She agreed not doing a good job at hiding her feelings. She wanted to wear the nice dress, have a cute flower arrangement on her wrist, and show off her date to the rest of the school. Right now, she didn't have any options. To be honest, I wanted to ask her out, but I didn't want to ruin our friendship. She knew I liked girls and guys. She hadn't given me any vibes of a romantic interest, so I'll stay in the friend zone. Thank you very much. I like it here. Our plan to get her out of the house went without any issues. We were going to a party, but she wore a heavy gray knitted sweater and boring jeans. I dressed up a little in a bright hot pink top, a thrifted leather jacket, and some torn jeans that made them look expensive. Maggie was always smarter than me. I never considered my outfit may cause some suspicion. We were on the front porch heading down the stairs when her father stepped out the front door. 
his arms crossed. We froze, convinced we had been caught. Are you girls going somewhere tonight? He pressed. He never raised his voice, but he could make a drill sergeant sweat. We're going to the movies before studying to fatten her up with overpriced popcorn. I commented, trying to sound convincing. That is not what you told me, he replied. I half expected him to order Maggie back into the house. Instead, he pulled out his wallet and handed over a few bills. The movies are expensive. Any drinking tonight? He asked point blank. Maggie gasped, pretending to be offended at the suggestion. I shook my head, feeling a little guilty for taking the money and lying straight to his face. Call me if you need anything. I promised we would. Under his watchful gaze, we walked down the driveway to my beat-up truck. Only when we couldn't see her house, we relaxed. I think we're in the clear, I commented after a few minutes. Her phone hadn't started to ring from her father, demanding we turn around. A worried expression came over her face, causing me to slow down. I almost pulled over by how uncomfortable she looked. I feel a little guilty, Maggie explained. No matter how I felt about the man, he had busted his ass raising her on his own without a single complaint. However, I don't think Maggie was a good person because she felt like she owed it to him. She was just born with a gentle soul. We can turn back, I offered. No, we'll go for an hour or so, get bored, and then actually go to the movies. She decided for us. I agreed. I bet we would get bored faster than that. I had no plans to drink because I was the driver, and Maggie wasn't the kind of person who wanted to get blackout drunk. Aside from chatting with friends, there wouldn't be much to do at this party. We arrived after the sunset with the event already in full swing. Someone hooked up speaks blaring, terrible-sounding dance music that was just constant beats and nothing else. A massive bonfire had been started with students dancing around it, drinks in hand. I saw a few people I assumed to be older siblings of the students here, or people who had already graduated, but refusing to let go of their youth. A few of my other friends ambushed me when we arrived. I made sure to always have Maggie in my line of sight as I chatted with a rotating group of classmates. She had found someone from her club to talk with. A red plastic cup was handed to her, which she politely accepted. The crowd grew denser. Soon I stopped being able to watch Maggie to only get glimpses of her every few minutes. I hate myself for getting distracted and not keeping a better eye on her. While a friend was talking to me about his prom date, I realized I hadn't checked in on her for at least 10 minutes. Normally, I wasn't so overprotective. A bad feeling in my gut made me take out my phone to text her. No response. My friend noticed I was getting worried and asked what was wrong. I questioned him if he had seen Maggie and he shook his head. I tried calling her only to have it drop two rings in. That was odd. The next call didn't even connect. Did she turn off her phone? No, she wouldn't do that. I excused myself to squeeze through the crowd looking for her. I would never forgive myself if something happened. Fear started to rise into my throat no matter how hard I pushed it down. I raised my voice over the music asking any familiar face if they had seen my friend. Most shook their head, but one pointed in the direction of where the cars were parked by the woods. I wasted no time racing over there calling out her name. I had no explanation for why I grew so frantic so quickly. I just knew something was wrong. I ran between all the cars, stopping near my truck in case she had gone over there for a break from the crowds. By sheer chance, I spotted a few figures slip between the trees into the darkness. My heart sank when I realized they were dragging something. No, someone. If it wasn't my friend, those bastards were going to hurt someone else. I took off after them, not thinking clearly. I had my phone in my hand ready to call the police depending on what I saw. I should have called them first. A burst of pain came to my face as something slammed hard against my nose. I cried out, falling to the ground and seeing stars. Some fucker just punched me in the face. He had been waiting behind a tree for me to run close enough. The person tried to grab my arm and I lashed out. A swift kick landed hard between his legs. Blood dripped from my nose and my eyes adjusted to the darkness too late. A powerful arm wrapped around my neck from behind. No matter how hard I kicked and screamed, I couldn't get free. The person was twice my size and double my weight. 
Stop screaming or I'll take it out on your friend. A cold voice said. I stopped struggling long enough to process what was going on. There were three of them. The guy holding me, the one on the ground groaning in pain, and the person who spoke holding a long, threatening knife at his side. Maggie was on the ground, passed out, most likely from the drink she had been handed. I recognized the guy I kicked to be the someone from her anime club. The one with the knife took a second to recognize. He was three years older than us. I vaguely remember him getting kicked out of school for something, but wasn't sure what. Based on the size of the third guy, he must be from the football team. If you touch her, I'll rip off your fucking face. I hissed a white-hot rage over taking the fear for a second. Oh, that's a fun idea. He replied, his dark eyes giving off no hits of emotion. He took a few steps closer, the knife reflecting off the moonlight. This guy was just not right. A single glance could tell you that. I found myself pressing my body against the person holding me back, trying to stay away from the calmest person in the group. I was going to see how many cuts it took to kill someone and then hand her over to these two, but taking off someone's face sounds interesting. I did not want to find out if the threat was valid or him just trying to be edgy. I kicked out my foot trying to knock the knife from his hand. He stepped back just in time to avoid it. The arm around my neck held on tighter until I saw lights flicker at the corner of my vision. Finally, he let go but kept hold of my upper arm. If I could, I would have ripped all three of them apart with my bare hands. I cursed the fact I had all this rage trapped in such a small body. You're joking, right? I just wanted to have a good time, not kill anyone. The other one spoke up, recovering from the kick. His leader looked over him. His expression never changed. In one swift motion, he brought down the knife, slicing off a piece of his lackey's ear. He stood in shock as blood poured down the side of his face, then started to scream. His hands flew up over the wound, getting soaked in an instant. The football player looked as scared as I felt. He was bigger, but he didn't think he could stand up to the psycho in front of us. The knife was raised in my direction, dead eyes landing on mine. I'll let you pick. What's coming off first, nose or an ear? he said, hands steady. Sweat dripped down the base of my neck as I considered the choices. I could live without an ear. Are those easy to stitch back on? My eye caught my phone on the ground. It dropped when I got hit. If only I called the cops when I had the chance. Ear, I finally said. He nodded and turned away. To my horror, he started towards Maggie. My body went into fight mode again. I scratched, screamed, kicked, and did everything to get away to stop him. The football player was just too strong, but I did do some damage. My stomach flipped in fear as time slowed down. I couldn't do anything but scream the words that could save us. Please help! I yelled so loud the words tore my throat and the sound echoed through the trees. The sound was so loud it even made him stop for a moment to double check if anyone from the party heard. They hadn't. Someone else had. Heavy footsteps came closer until a person I knew very well stopped five feet from us. I stared dumbfounded at who it was. Mr. Walker? I asked, voice weak. I never would have expected to see Maggie's father out in these woods. His ice-cold eyes carefully studied each person, then stopped at his daughter passed out on the forest floor. Did they do anything to her? He asked, his voice so calm it scared me. I shook my head thanking God I arrived fast enough. He accepted the answer and then met eyes with the ringleader of the small pack. After comparing the two, I decided I was more afraid of Mr. Walker. He had an unhuman coldness the other man lacked. She's right. We didn't do anything. How about you take them and we don't talk about tonight? I would hate to call my father for a misunderstanding. He raised his hands and let the knife drop to the ground. His voice sounded annoyed, and it was the first hint of emotion I heard from him. I wanted to get the hell out of here. Mr. Walker was unarmed. Who knows what other weapons these three may have hidden. I assumed we would grab Maggie and leave. I greatly underestimated how angry a father could get and ignored signs over the past five years, hinting there was something very, very different about the man standing in front of us. Mr. Walker's head slightly moved to the right, and the bleeding groupie was launched into the forest so fast I didn't register the movement at first. A confused look came over the ringleader's face as his head moved, expecting to see the groupie still there. 
Mr. Walker twitched his head upwards, never ever taking his eyes off his main target. The football player yelped as he was lifted into the air by an invisible force, disappearing into the trees. The screams turned into a garbled mess, then cut, could as several loud cracking sounds echoed through the darkness. It was my turn to scream when a waterfall of blood came pouring down, soaking the leader from head to toe. He jolted back, losing all his composure. In a pathetic display, he tripped over his own feet in panic to get away. Sobs started at the same time as the pleas for his life, then demanded to know what was going on. Mr. Walker took a step forward. The leader's left leg twisted like a dishrag. He screeched, body twitching in pain. Another step destroyed his right arm. In a flash, there was nothing left but explosion of fleshy pulp. No matter how gruesome the sight was, I couldn't bring myself to look away. Even with his injuries, he was able to drag himself along, tears freely flowing down his face, washing away some blood. Mr. Walker let him crawl along the rough forest floor, leaving a trail of blood behind. Even if he got away from the monster so close by, he was a goner from his injuries. Somehow, he knew that. He still wanted to get some last words in. The person trying to be a monster easily cracked when he came across a real one. What are you? He whispered, sounding like a child. Anne, please take Maggie and bring her home. Mr. Walker hadn't turned his head to address me. I think if he did, I might have fainted. Since my best friend was so small, I could get her in my back. I didn't stop to see what else happened in those woods that night. My heart simply couldn't take any more. All my muscles ached and I was drenched in sweat by the time I loaded Maggie into my truck. Wasting no time, I rushed away from the party. Away from that forest. It was a miracle I didn't get a speeding ticket. I should have just dropped her off at home and left without ever going back to that house after what I saw. It took some effort to get her tucked into bed. I wasn't sure what they gave her or how much, so I made sure she was sleeping on her side. That's what you do with a drunk person, right? I cursed, realizing I left my phone in the woods. I should have gone home. It just didn't feel right to leave my best friend in such a vulnerable state. I stayed in her room all night, watching over her. Bored out of my mind, I found myself looking around her room, staring at the items on the shelves. I never realized until then how many interests of ours we have because of each other. She had a book series I had just gotten into because she recommended them, and she owned DVD box sets of shows I had suggested to her. Monster father or not, it would hurt if I had to lose my best friend because of tonight. Near dawn, the front door opened. My body tensed up hearing footsteps come up the stairs. My heart beat hard in my chest as the door opened a crack. A set of cold eyes staring into the room. Wash your face, Mr. Walker told me and closed the door. I had rubbed away the blood but didn't properly wash it away. I waited to hear him go down the hallway into his room before heading to the bathroom. My phone had been placed on the side of the sink. Was her father angry? I did take her to the party. If he could do that to those guys without raising a hand, what could he do to me? Did he want to make sure Maggie was being looked after before dealing out the punishment? I decided not to wait to find out. Silently, I crept down the stairs slowly, heading to the door, not hearing him behind me. My body tense as I took the first steps outside, moments away from freedom. Anne, I stopped halfway down the porch steps, blood cold. I had no choice but to turn around to face him. Are you pissed off at us? I asked in a trembling voice. I am angry. Not at you. She is not going to be a child forever. She will want to have new experiences, good and bad. I am angry I cannot always be there for her, and she'll have troubles in her life. I am glad she had you tonight. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding. Tears came to my eyes that I rubbed away. I had been the one to pressure Maggie into this, and I had taken my eyes off of her. I knew there was a risk of someone doing something to her, or me. We are girls after all. But what were the chances we would come across a deranged lunatic and his little followers? Are the cops going to ask questions? I said, worry filling my thoughts. There had been a lot of blood, and three young people are going to be missing. At least one of them should have families that care enough to file a report. No, you weren't seen with them by anyone that night and the remains will look like an animal attack. Tragic, but reasonable. 
I felt my blood run cold. I wanted to ask the same question I heard the night before. What was this man? And yet I dreaded the possibilities. Is Maggie, I mean, you two look alike, but she doesn't seem. I said trying to get my thoughts in order. He crossed his arms considering my question. This was the longest conversation was had ever had. For a moment, he wasn't going to tell me what I needed to know. I may have been the first person to see his other side and live. It is complicated. He started deeming me worthy of information. I found this house years ago in shambles. Squatters had taken over. I was looking for a meal and found one. The woman was already dead from an overdose. I am not certain if that was Maggie's mother. Her father attempted to sell his infant daughter to me for his next fix. I devoured him, then stole his appearance. I had planned to eat the child as well, but she was so small. I had no idea about any of this. Since I moved here a few years ago, I didn't know what kind of place this neighborhood was like when Maggie was younger. I didn't know how I felt about what I had just been told. Mr. Walker wasn't human. I've felt that since the start. Somehow, he raised a healthy and well-rounded child all the way to a naive yet perfect teen. I think it's good you found her, I said after some thought. He shifted on the spot, appearing uncomfortable in a rare display of emotion. Killing a person is stealing away all the choices their life may have held. I didn't just steal his life and appearance. I took away any possibilities of him getting his life back on track. I've considered if it would have been better for Maggie to be raised by a human, regardless of his hardships. I never would have thought the person in front of me would ever second-guess himself. He had been a perfect father this entire time. I would have rather a monster like him watch over my best friend than a man who would toss her life away for nothing. Yeah, fuck all that. You're her dad. Plain and simple. I don't care about the moral aspects. Just that you're the best person for the job. Unless, the first person who dumps her is also going to experience an animal attack. He raised an eyebrow, almost amused over the fact I swore in front of him for the first time. I had been worried over my reactions as I watched her grow older. I always knew I could not protect her from the entire world, and it would harm her in the long run if she never dealt with hardships. However, what if someone hurt her? Really hurt her? What would I do then? So far it has not been an issue. I can be there for her through breakups or rejection. I would imagine last night was a special case. He nodded at his explanation, but it didn't make him less scary in my eyes. I also considered if raising her would soften my feelings towards humans. If I would see them as someone's child, I could not harm them if needed. It seems as if I shall always care more about my child than another's. Yeah, still scary as hell. I would never accidentally hurt Maggie, but now I really, really couldn't do anything to upset her. Mr. Walker appeared to like me well enough. Still, it was a risk I couldn't take. I am aware this is a large request. I would like you to support her over the next few days. She will be confused about what happened when she wakes up. I do not want her to think I am upset with her, and therefore cannot admit I know about the outing. For a big scary monster, he sure was a softy when it came to her. You're going to make me do all the work? I half joked. Yes. He admitted without an ounce of shame. Since you saved the both of us, I suppose I'll stick around. I do care about her more than I'm scared of you. I shrugged, not realizing what I suggested until the words were out of my mouth. I felt my face turn red as I mentally assured myself that girls just talked like that about their best friends all the time. It didn't mean anything beyond that. I thought I was in the clear when he started to go back inside. That reminded me of the reason why I came out here to speak with you in the first place. When are you two going to commit to prom? I would like to buy Maggie a dress soon. I've never been so mortified in my entire life. I would have rather he killed me than questioned when I was going to be brave enough to ask out his daughter. We're not, I sputtered. She doesn't see me that way. I love you both no matter how dense you are. Ask her out before I tell her for you. He threatened. You wouldn't dare. I gasped in horror. Yes, I would. After all, I am a monster. With that, he shut the door on my face, leaving me with an embarrassing task that I thought might kill me.
With a lot of new motivation, I finally did confess to Maggie after she recovered from the shock of the failed party. As far as I can tell, she's aware her father is different, but not what How would do to protect her. For now, I want to keep it like that. I know her and how she would accept him no matter what. Right now, Mr. Walker was just too scared to face that fact. We needed to wait until he was ready, or maybe force him into it like he did with me and Maggie going to prom. I'm not sure if I would have gathered myself enough to finally ask her out without that push from him. I needed to repay the favor. He is a monster. No doubt about that. He killed three people and framed it so perfectly, everyone assumed it was a random animal attack like he planned without any questions. I don't know what is truly hiding underneath his stolen appearance. Sure, he still scares me, but as long as I can be with the person I care about the most, I think I can deal with a future monster father-in-law.